it should be regulated for protection of society. And there is always trade-off. We have to pay something. So if we would like to use safe airliner, so then we have just, we spent a long time in queues in the airport. There is, there is trade-off. There is the cost we have paid for the safety. Yeah, and so I think that this economic approach to regulation is very important for understanding why regulation is necessary. And the regulation limits also, there is this limit of the liberty and freedom. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Mr. Hobbs. Thank you, Jan, for this question. Um, on coming back of certain freedoms, I'm quite sure that, for example, Am American libertarians would uh, say that the recent decisions of the Supreme Court in America were the festival of freedom, right? There was this uh, opinion of Clarence Thomas written on uh, the right to bear guns in New York, so now you can officially again bear a loaded gun in New York. In the American context, this is interpreted as a freedom, right? You have a right to bear arms. Same with uh, interruptions, but I will not, not, not bring this debate here because that's a very specifically American topic, right? Now, uh, freedom of speech. Uh, as of today, uh, the Elon Musk is the new CEO of Twitter, as you may know, and uh, some people uh, say that this will, this will be a new era of the freedom of speech, right? As you know, the, the biggest topic in, the contro in controlling of speech today is not the state control. It's not the state that censors you. Right? It's usually some giant social network. But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, you as a user, you don't really care who censors you. You are being censored. That's the bottom line. And by the way, this is coming back to John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill has a beautiful passage about uh, the difference of being oppressed by the state and being oppressed by your fellow citizens. Here we go. That's, that's, that's the question of 2022. Right? And what John Stuart Mill says that Yes, state can be very... So in 18, uh, 1840s in London, where John Stuart Mill lived, uh, well, women usually didn't do much stuff, but it was not regulated by the law. There was no law saying that, for example, a woman cannot go and do this, you know. It was usually the fellow citizens who would look at her and say, what are you doing? It was, this cult it was these cultural norms, these much more vague interpretation of liberties that were constraining uh, people in doing what they wanted to do. So, yes, I believe that there may be some freedoms coming back. Uh, thank you, Stepan. Uh, and then I, I would like to ask you, the audience, if you have uh, any uh, questions. Uh, we have a few minutes left before. Who has been the last to speak, sorry, your name has, missed, has made a point talking about the possible limitations to freedom or uh, expansion of freedom that uh, these uh, social networks uh, bring to us. Now, personally, I see two possible challenges. The first uh, is that uh, social networks, in the name of freedom of expression, allow all possible defamatory statements, offenses, and then uh, obtaining redress uh, is difficult. Also because there are issues with uh, international uh, applications of law and so on. On the other side, the opposite. In the name of protection of minorities, uh, in the name of fighting against offenses, hate speech, it can be the we come to the opposite result. So that f manifestations of free speech are actually uh, banned. And uh, how would you see uh, the development in the sense that how, if in case you agree with these two types of challenges, how would you see a possible way to somehow mitigate the effects that the challenges can create. Thank you very much. Thank you. So it's probably a question for Mr. Hobbs. So uh, if we could. Thank you. So just to get it clear, you were asking what can specifically these tech giants do to moderate speech? Was that a question? I, I didn't get the I didn't get the, the the chunk of it. I guess. May I reformulate? Please do. 
uh, I am living in Prague and you are living, for example, in New York. I can go to my Twitter, uh, Facebook and write that uh, you are a pedophile. And uh, it may be or something like this or something offensive or, and it may be difficult for you to control my action. Uh, also because uh, th 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 there are cases, uh, you may go to a lawyer, but I am in Prague, you are in New York, it's difficult. On the other side, I want to say that uh, I am against migration, for example. Uh, I think that too many migrants end up uh, committing crimes. And it may be that uh, this uh, is also, on the other side, something that indeed the social network ban, or if, not, if this is not the correct example, something equivalent. I wanted to ask if uh, you feel that uh, these two challenges really exist and can put in jeopardy both the freedom of speech as well as on the other side can allow uh, too much space for offenses that uh, are not somehow actionable. The, is my question clear now? Yeah, no, no, it's an excellent question. I'm just thinking about the proper answer because it, it really is a complicated one. So, yes, I do believe that these challenges exist. That, 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 that's, that's the bottom line answer I, I would like to give. Now, uh, legally, of course, it is very difficult, almost impossible to, to regulate, right? What they try to do at the social networks, you probably know that, is to create algorithms that will solve this because exactly as you say, there might be a person living in New York Tr being asked to moderate speech somewhere in Prague. Well, well, they have clearly no idea what these people in Prague are talking about. So there are certain mechanisms, certain algorithms that would control the speech in their stead. Well, this clearly uh, looks as, as a complete sham because even people for, for the most innocent forms of speech are being uh, banned and kicked out of Twitter for because of this algorithm, so, so we can see that this clearly is not the ideal solution, right? To suggest a solution, I will be absolutely fair, I don't know. I don't know. Because legally, it is almost impossible. I, I agree with you. And I would come back to my favorite John Stuart Mill to say that, you know, the most effective uh, way of controlling is not through law, it is through culture. But l let's get to it uh, later. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, Japanese embassy. Uh, my name is Iko Shoji, um, uh, uh, Embassy for Japan. Uh, thank you for uh, interesting discussion. And uh, I would like to uh, put one uh, concrete question. Um, um, I suppose uh, everyone agree that uh, the COVID time uh, poses us all an opportunity to think about uh, what is the freedom and what is the duty. And uh, uh, as far as I understand that uh, in Europe, uh, every government uh, decided very strict measures. Um, uh, measures uh, was various, but uh, I uh, uh, would like to concentrate to the uh, wearing the mask, duty of wearing a mask or respirator. Um, and my question is, um, uh, how do you uh, think about the, uh, the restrictive measures uh, on the uh, wearing mask? Uh, I'm asking because uh, the uh, uh, Japanese government's approach uh, to wearing mask was quite different than uh, European countries. Uh, Japanese government never put uh, uh, a duty of uh, wearing a mask or respirator as a, as a binding uh, measures. Uh, but uh, on the contrary, the people, uh, Japanese citizens, uh, very voluntarily, everyone, almost everyone, uh, wear mask. But on the contrary, in Europe, um, uh, the, uh, the governments uh, put very, uh, very strict measures. But uh, the citizens uh, not necessarily uh, put or respect uh, the, the duties. Uh, of course, I know that in Czech Republic, 
uh, it was cancelled by uh, constitutional court at the end of the day. Uh, but uh, I would like to ask you uh, what uh, your feeling or your uh, assessment uh, about the uh, duties uh, decided by uh, each government in Europe uh, on the wearing the mask in the during the COVID time. Thank you. Something on this, Mr. Darin, for instance? Well, so of course. Because we will have to conclude soon. We, uh, we will immediately go yeah. for a new yeah. panel. So uh, I was once in Japan, so I spent there two weeks, and it was in 2008. And I was surprised. So, uh, how many people wear the face masks? Yeah, so, that was for the first time, so I could see, I don't know and that your people, for your people, j this, um, um, this disease, this, this COVID disease, so you were better prepared than we were here in European countries um, against this extension of this disease, on, on this pandemic uh, extension. Uh, th that, that is the reason why European governments had to, had to be strict here concerning uh, concerning protection against these uh, these one so we we had for example we had she stressed just that i should wear i should wear a mask um, al almost everywhere also outside uh, for just for her protection because she was she was afraid she was she was afraid because she was more endangered than I was. So from this point of view, from this point of view, so I understood also the measures adopted by European governments as uh, measures limited by time. And so we can see that they were limited by time. But we can also see that the measures had different efficiency. Yeah, so that the number of diseased people differed from country to country. And it would be quite interesting study about that. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank all the uh, panelists, uh, Mr. Daring, Mr. Oterta, uh, <coughs> Mr. Schwartz, and uh, Mr. Hobza. And uh, uh, we uh, will immediately start a, a second panel. And uh, so thank you very much once again.
Ladies and gentlemen, we will start in a minute. So we will start with our next panel. Uh, so welcome to this panel called uh, American versus European Liberalism, uh, conclusion, Confusion of Concepts. So we will speak about the differences. I will, uh, and not only, I would like to introduce uh, Roman Joch, director of the Civic Institute and also Jan Macháček, chairman of the board of the Institute for Politics and Society. And online we have um, Jan Marco Bovenzi, project manager of the Fondazione uh, Luigi Einaudi. So welcome and benvenuti. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your invitation. And so thank you, thank you too. And we will, uh, I would like to say that we have not only, uh, let's say, liberal representative, but uh, I, <laughs> Roman Joch, we can, we can call you not as a clearly liberal, but more conservative. So it's a, it can be also the um, uh, discussion, not only between liberals, but also with the people representing conservative values, but you are also interested in the topics connected with the United States and uh, politics in the, in the United States. And, but I would, li I would like to start with the question. Uh, there is a name of the panel, American versus European liberalism. So what are the differences and why uh, we speak why do we speak about confusion of concepts? So, question for you, Mr. Joch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, both for the introduction and for giving me the floor now. Well, um, d there are so many confusions, so I really wonder where to start. Uh, I have an anthology of texts originally published in 1964 and the anthology is called What is Conservatism? with a question mark. One of those essays included in that anthology was an essay written by Friedrich August von Hayek as a postscript to his book uh, the Constitution of Freedom. The book was published in 1960 by the University of Chicago Press. And the title of that essay was Why I Am Not a Conservative. The author, the, the person who was responsible for that anthology, who was in charge of picking up essays to include in that anthology, his name was Frank Meyer, uh, he was convinced that Hayek's essay was such a brilliant contribution to a conservative thought. His essay titled, Why I Am Not a Conservative, was such a brilliant addition or <coughs> empowerment or enrichment of a conserva American conservative thought that he included that essay into his anthology, What Is or What Was in 1964, Conservatism in America. Uh, 
To make the long story short, there was, and it is now disappearing, a distinction between American and European terminology. In America, well, that was one of the parts of Hayek's, Hayek's essay. In America, the original tradition of the American Republic, of the founding fathers, of Abraham Lincoln, was classical liberalism. By classical liberalism, we understand a doctrine of individual rights in some form uh, natural individual rights given to us not by the consent of government or by the good will of government but by our own human nature or by God, it depends. And those rights, among them the right to life, liberty and pursuit of happiness, to quote the Declaration of Independence of America, are the main reason why we establish governments. So the purpose of government was perceived as a, as a tool, not as the end, but as a mean to a higher end. And the higher end was or were natural rights. Among them freedom, among them freedom. So American political tradition was classical liberal. Uh, it corresponded, and again, that's Hayek's point of view, it corresponded to the Whig, Whig uh, spectrum or Whig part of the British political scene or British parliament in those times, late 18th century. So all Americans, either those more conservative, quote unquote, like Hamilton or John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, or those more radical, like Thomas Jefferson, or those in, um, in the middle, like James Madison, all of them were Whigs to use the British, in those times, contemporary political terminology. Who were American Tories? British Tories, in those times, supported royal privileges, feudal privileges, uh, established church, in the case of England, Anglican church or Episcopalian church, and they were more paternalistic. And those American Tories left the country during the American Revolution and the war for independence for Canada. So till this day, Canadian conservatives are more paternalistic than American conservatives. And um, Canadian conservatives are descendants of Tories of those times, and American conservatives are descendants or followers of Whigs of those times. So America, or the United States of America, is the only country in the world where conservative and classical liberal means the same. Classical liberals, liberal means freedom, individual freedom, small government, division of powers, federalism, and so on, and so on. The right to private property, and so on. So that was the substance. Classical liberalism was the substance of the American Republic, and conservatives were those who defended or tried to protect American heritage. And because the American heritage was classical liberal, conservatives in America were more or less classical liberals using the European terminology. That's the only country in the world. We in Europe, we in Europe have always had a conservative tradition w which was not classically liberal, which was more statist, more paternalist, paternalistic. It could start with Metternich. It could continue with Benjamin Disraeli, Earl of Beaconsfeld, uh, with Bismarck and with many other conservatives in today's Europe, the main paternalist conservative who is illiberal, meaning rejecting both the classical liberal tradition of the minimal government or small government and rejecting 
social modern liberalism i will i will touch that in a few minutes in a few seconds uh, that that paternalist conservative is of course victor orban so victor orban is uh, an inheritor of metternich bismarck uh, paternalism tory paternalism um, now what has happened what has happened was terrible for classical liberals. In the 20th century, many people who claimed to be liberals rejected the tradition of a limited government, of individual freedom, and welcomed welfare state. Well, yes, it could be a prudent measure to accept a welfare state in a, in a democracy when people expect that the government will give you something, some welfare. But uh, we must be aware that if government gives you something, the government must take it from you first, firstly. Government has nothing to give you which government had not taken from you or has been indebted, had been indebted by, by a debt. Um, in America, what has happened? In the 30s, in the 30s of the 20th century, American social democrats, supporters of then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, called themselves, called themselves liberals. They were, in fact, genuine social democrats, both Democrats and social socialist Democrats. They admired many aspects of Mussolini's fascism in Italy, in economy, in the relationship between the government, the state, and economy. Of course, they rejected his authoritarian rule. They were Democrats, but they were socialist Democrats. And in America, liberals, in America, those social Democrats call themselves liberals. There were some, some American personalities, both politicians and intellectuals, who cried, well, that was all wrong. We, supporters of minimal government, were the original liberals. But there, for example, Senator Robert Taft, Republican senator from Ohio, or Henry Mencken from Baltimore, Maryland, and others who claimed we were the original, demo, uh, the original liberals. And why socialists call themselves liberals? That made no sense, but that has happened. However, in the second half of the 20th century, especially in the late 60s or since the late 60s, for American social democrats calling themselves liberals, more important than economic issues, were issues moral and cultural, and they were liberal, that was justifies, justified in their calling themselves liberal in, uh, in, uh, on morality and culture issues. And now we see a trend that Czech or European or Central European liberals or self-called liberals are using, are using more and more American terminology, which means accepting larger government, social democratic government, and cultural liberal attitudes. European terminology. And now, in the 90s, who were liberals in the 90s? Well, the number one liberal, the Mr. Liberal, the, the old great man of Czech liberalism in the 90s was Tomáš Ježek, translator of Hayek. That was the liberal number one. And all others were his either fans or supporters or followers. Now, if now, if you, if you say liberal in the Czech society, whom do you mean? Well, the weekly respect and the daily N, for example, which means social democracy, more or less, um, support for the American Democratic Party, which is on political economic issues, social democratic or socialist even, and culturally liberal, yes. So the American terminology is migrating to Europe 
and influencing European discourse. And I myself don't see any, any trends which would you know, change that situation, for better or worse. And now, what is going to be the fate of original classical liberals like Hayek, like Luigi Einaudi, one of the founding members of the, of the Mont Pelerin Society and president of Italy in the 50s, I believe, and many others. Uh, some of them have uh, succumbed to the temptation of flowing with the mainstream and they are becoming left liberals in the American and even more European meaning of the word. Some others are just calling themselves conservatives without rejecting their basic classical liberal principles. I can mention in the Czech society uh, Sasha Vondra, former dissident, very liberal friend of Václav Havel, then politician. He is one of the most conservative Czech uh, MEPs, members of the European Parliament. He is a member of the uh, European Conservative and Reformist, or ECR, European Conservative and Reformist Parliamentary Group. But uh, his views are classically liberal. And I can, or Mirek Tepulanek, former Czech Prime Minister, 2006 till 2009. Uh, I once was a witness at his lecture at the Institute of International Relations, so it was a neutral ground, and he started his lecture with, well, I am a neo, I am a neo-liberal, I am a neo-conservative, I am a neo-Catholic. <laughs> he got baptized in his, in his major aid. I am a neo-Andertal, I am a neo-Neandertal. So I, I am the man of the past. But his positions, neo-liberal, neo-conservative, meant, uh, well, he was for a smaller government than the alternative. Not small enough for us, but, but smaller than the alternative. And we can continue. What have classic liberals and conservatives in common? That could be very long, but I will mention just two aspects. First, private property. Both conservatives and classical liberals consider private property to be a basic social, human, institutional and political right and a force for good. Without private property, there would be no good society. Secondly, spontaneous order. Conservatives are liberals of the past. Traditions are results of decisions, small, minor decisions by the people in the past results of their choices. So both classical liberals and conservatives believe if government will leave us alone, everything will be okay. This, we will survive. We as a society will survive. Spontaneous order will be established. Just don't be too impatient and believe that government must direct everything. Spontaneous order will take care of everything. And uh, are there going to be normal, original classical liberals? Yes. Yes, of course, there will be many of them. However, by tendencies of the age, of the contemporary age, they will either move to the left liberal, which means socialist direction, statist direction, or they make some, some deal with conser conservatives, but those conservatives cannot be paternalist conservatives. Like are really those are my opening remarks for, for time being. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, I would like to move to, to, to Italy. And the same question for Gianmarco. Uh, where do you see the differences uh, between uh, American versus European liberalism, 
and why do we speak about confusion of concepts if you, if you if you share the you can also react on uh, romaniov definitely so please I, thank you for your question i would actually like to to focus for example if i may on on the example of italy because this is perhaps the uh, uh, the case study that i would bring uh, to the attention as uh, as to represent the, the the European liberalism, I think one of the main problems and uh, and differences is that in Italy uh, liberalism and liberals actually lack on one hand a political representation, like a uniform one. Um, as I know, there, there has been in the second half of the 20th century only one party officially named like liberal party in Italy, uh, but it never reached a consensus as higher as the 6% in its top years. And we're talking about the 60s with uh, Giovanni Malagodi, uh, a good, uh, I would say, a good friend of, of Einaudi somehow. And um, so therefore, when such a political representation lacks, is it, is it very difficult also for the for the citizens for the people for uh, those who are interested in politics but also for the general public to understand what liberalism actually is because i see a lot of confusion uh, not only of concepts um, distinguishing the american and the european liberalism but i see confusion on what liberalism is some someone says it is a matter of economics uh, of political choices in, in macroeconomy, in political economics. Others say liberalism is a matter of social rights, and this would actually make it a little bit more uh, close somehow to, to the liberal uh, in, in uh, perhaps in Northern Europe, I guess, in comparing to the Italian or Mediterranean uh, liberalism. So there is there's a lot of confusion, and therefore it is very difficult for, uh, for liberalism to have I would say an electoral body and it, it is it is difficult uh, it is it is difficult to to define it in in Italy and perhaps um, it is uh, it is it is difficult for 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 liberalism to have a precise identity at least in 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 my country which I want to bring the attention to um, as concerning the difference with the American liberalism I <laughs> I, I I cannot add anything more to to what Professor said because of course um, he 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 explained the whole the whole uh, the whole thing and much better than I can ever say. But th if if I can, I, I would just stress the difference between again the American and and the the Italian uh, liberalism uh, as how is it intended here. Therefore, I. Mm, I would say, I would say this because now liberals are, let's say, um, compared to conservatives, because the, the the tide goes with an economic aspect of liberalism, and thus in Italy there is this sort of equation that liberal economy with lack of state intervention means conservatorism. And therefore, liberals would vote, for example, uh, right-wing parties. But again, is this in Europe? Maybe the social aspect of liberalism is, I think, not as perceived as it is for maybe in the U.S. So, I would, I would stop here with with my intervention. I don't know if uh, the answer was. Uh, um, was clear or what you think so please feel free also to uh to make questions and and, and to ask more okay thank you thank you john marco and the same question for um, mr mahache thank you uh so uh on behalf of the institute i would also like to thank uh, the excellent presentation by mr Joch, which was very very, very inspiring. Uh, 
So I should uh, also add a few things. I think it's very important with the, with, when, when we speak about the confusion also to look about or think about the term. Uh, we could discuss it for hours, but it's just uh, uh, the term liberal democracy, which is uh, very, very much uh, popular and used uh, these days. And uh, it's also related to the security and geopolitical issues and with the war, which I mentioned at the beginning, uh, at the opening of the, uh, of, of the conference, because not only there, are, there is this imperialistic aggression of Mr. Putin uh, against the, uh, of Russia against uh, Ukraine, uh, but uh, some uh, people emphasize and see uh, why the contest of it and say that it's also a, a, a competition or war between liberal democracies and autocracies. And uh, I would uh, myself uh, agree and to an extent, but how to define this liberal democracy? It's an open question. Pe people, open question. People see it differently. It, if it means constitutional democracy, which would be a nicer term for, for me, that uh, that uh, countries which uh, are uh, limiting the democratic uh, government. Uh, because democratically you can elect whatever someone who would uh, send all the people with uh, short trousers to the concentration camp or whatever. So, uh, so if we speak about constitutional democracy, we can speak about democracy which is limiting freedoms through the rule of law, through the separation of uh, powers, freedom of um, uh, press, and uh, the constitution itself, et cetera. That, that would be okay, but for many people in the West, for young generations, for political progressives, and see everywhere these days, says like, uh, which emphasizes democracy, inclusivity, and uh, uh, sustainable development, or alternative energy, whatever, it depends on which billboard it is. So. If you would ask these young people and or people in the European co Commission who are created these slogans and billboards, what is a liberal democracy, they would probably say it's a democracy, inclusion, sustainable development, fighting the climate change, anti-racism, whatever, uh, and they would define it like this. And that's, that's a very problematic issue. And... Uh, Nothing against it. That's their political choice. That's their post to them or help. They are. It's. Uh, it makes them more popular with their citizens, uh, uh, not the voters, because they don't have elections. So with, uh, or they don't have proper free elections. So uh, with, with the difference of a uh, uh, few things, it's not that I am complaining about the world about about why uh, I can get angry why American liberals call themselves uh, liberals if they are just progressive, but progressive. But I would like to emphasize uh, a few things which are important. Uh, one thing is, which is uh, very problematic for myself is that uh, uh, even if we speak about the free expressions, it's kind of a new thing that uh, people are emphasizing their security and their and they feel threatened by someone's someone else's speech this is a new phenomenon which is uh, very problematic and it's more and more emphasized by american american so called liberals so we say if someone's speech is not correct people say that it should be limited because they feel threatened by someone else's speech. So this is kind of a new phenomenon because physical threats were something which we didn't relate in the past with uh, this uh, verbal expressions. That uh, uh, That's uh, one thing. I would uh, agree with uh, what uh, Mr. York mentioned here that uh, there is nothing uh, that government, uh, there's no value, there are no monetary instruments that government has ot ot on its own or ever created on its own to, to be able to distribute it. But we cannot, don't have to look at it 
only like monetarily or financially, we can uh, speak about uh, freedoms in this respect. It's, it's also, if we speak about this balance between, between freedom and security, if government, if you demand the government to protect you, to protect the society, it has to take some freedoms to be able to protect you. So it's also related uh, through this, because government doesn't have resources uh, to protect you, because it, it can only protect you uh, uh, using like, uh, quotes, uh, protect you to if it takes some uh, freedoms from you. And uh, I think it's uh, very important uh, to also emphasize that uh, this new, um, this American liberals these days, the another fashionable word is uh, equity. Uh, I have nothing against uh, equality. Equality at a start, at a starting point, equality of uh, opportunities, etc. But equity means something completely different. Equity means uh, not uh, equal opportunity, opportunities, but equal results. And uh, government says, or, or democrat, uh, politicians from the Democratic Party who call themselves liberals, they are telling their voters that they will enforce the equity. They promise them to enforce the equity, and uh, which is the most illiberal aim or goal I can uh, ever imagine. And uh, uh, through these, uh, uh, all these lines, which are also mentioned at the beginning of the conference, this ideology, this approach is being uh, uh, sent through all the media communication channels to Europe and is being accepted into here, as Mr. Joch rightly said, like for instance, uh, respect Deng, and they are taking, retaking exactly this kind of uh, ideology and calling, proudly calling themselves uh, liberal uh, media and feeding in more and more uh, confusion into our, into our space. So that's enough for the beginning. Back, back to Mr. Joch. Uh, today's event is called liberalism is not dead. So which, uh, which concept or which approach is closer to death? You, you described that American liberalism is moving into shortly in social democratic way. Uh, but European, uh, you also described the example of Alexander Wondra, uh, how liberal can uh, become uh, conserva some, someone who represents conservative uh, party, for example, in the European Parliament. So which concept is uh, closer to that? As I mentioned, this even this <laughs> called liberalism is not that. Because, uh, and also Mr. Outrata mentioned that liberalism is an optimistic approach. And uh, we, we don't, I think, uh, we don't live in a kind of uh, highly optimistic world now of the term today. His name was Randolph Burney um, and he had a famous sentence that war is the health of state. That during war all government institutions uh, get and demand and receive more powers than in those times in the in the peace and now we have been dealt for the last almost three years two and a half and more years something quite terrible the first was the pandemic i recognize and acknowledge in principle that during pandemic during the uh, during the threat to our health and even to lives of many people, that there should be some emergency powers of the government. So it's normal. It's reasonable and it's normal. Uh, however, there must be an understanding that when the crisis or, or the threat of pandemic ends, those emergency powers of government should be 
should be returned back to society. So government should voluntarily um, uh, surrender those powers. This year in February, on February the 24th, uh, one country, one European country or European Asian country attacked another European country. We formally, we as a, the Czech Republic are not um, in the war. So we are not um, uh, a warring power or, 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 or a country um, in a situation of war. However, from the very beginning, for very good reasons, and I agree completely with our incumbent government, uh, we have supported uh, the attacked country. And it is our own national interest that that attacked country should firstly survive, that's the minimum, and optimally should defeat the aggressor and impose such pains on the aggressor's army that the aggressor's army will not be capable to attack any other country in Europe in coming decades. That's the optimum solution for us, or the optimum outcome for us. And during those times, of course I would agree that there should be some extraordinary government powers. However, we still should have the perspective. We should keep the balance. We should keep in our minds that we support the effort of the attacked country uh, not in order to smash our own liberties. Uh, that's up for the discussion which speeches, which, which opinions should or should not be prohibited and eventually punished. Uh, however, if we are going to make a mistake, it's better to make a mistake on the side of liberty rather than against liberty. So I would say now in Europe is something after pandemic, COVID pandemic, and after the Russian aggression against Ukraine, we are in something like a low point of classical liberal understanding of freedom. However, uh, there, there, there is one, one issue which could lead to um, a resurgence or or rebirth of classical liberal understanding, and that's the freedom of speech. Uh, we should be very careful not to surrender our freedoms of speech for whatever reasons. And uh, of course, I would agree the intentions could be the best. But even with the best intentions, we should not surrender our freedom uh, for and of free speech to our own good governments. So my expectation is we are now in the low. And now we, we are in such a low from the classical liberal perspective that the only alternative or the, no, the, the only way out is going for the better. And for me, or at least for my understanding, uh, the most potent, the most strong, or the strongest uh, a point in a, in a resurgence or rebirth of classical liberalism is going to be the freedom of speech. Um, by the way, we are in a quite interesting situation that perhaps the most intellectuals, people who live by ideas, who, who earn their money by, by spreading ideas, by propagating ideas, by defending ideas, are the least likely to defend freedom of speech and ordinary people or non-intellectuals are more keen on preserving freedom of speech, are more allergic towards attempts to, to, to restrict freedom of speech. I, um, uh, the late Erwin Kristol, who was an American Trotskyist then social democrat, then conservative more or less, he once described as a, a, as a task of neoconservatives is to is to explain to intellectuals why they were wrong and to explain to the people, normal people, why they were right. So the, on the issue of, of the freedom of speech, 
I would rather trust uh, an average Czech man or a woman uh, than an average Prague intellectual. So thank you. And Jan Marco, uh, the same question, uh, which concept is? But liberalism is not that, but which concept is, is uh, closer to death, because uh, as Mr. Joch uh, spoke about this, uh, the lowest point. So what, what, what is your position? What are, what are your ideas about this? You mean to which, uh, which point of liberalism is closer to death, is the question? If it is European uh, liberalism or American. I think the European liberalism has an issue of uniformity. Again, I keep the line of, uh, of my introductory five minutes. Uh -huh. And I guess this is, this is a point that might make it closer to death. Because the, the American approach, the, well, the approach in the United States um, has perhaps a, a more solid uh, ground, more uniform ground. The United States is one country while Europe is a lot of countries. And therefore, gi giving or uh, thinking about a uniform perspective in Europe, because for instance, political representation of liberalism in the Netherlands is definitely different from an hypothetical political representation of liberalism in Italy or in Spain. So when we have this confusion of concepts, I think that the whole idea, the whole uh, concept uh, is at risk because we don't know basically what we are talking about. Of course, we, we know what we're talking about, especially when dealing with classical liberalism. But but in a future perspective, I see again a lot of a lot of confusion. And, and therefore, I think the European liberalism might be a little bit more at risk comparing to the American liberalism, which is which is there since decades. <laughs> and and does not uh, societies and ideologies, economics and political orientations in the different European in countries and also if we want to some yes, if we want to summarize it, I would say so. Of course, it is only my opinion, of course. But uh, but yes, in in very very short, uh, you did <laughs> you did a good synthesis. Yes, indeed. I think Mr. Joch agree also with you. Yeah. So I, as I see his reaction, Mr. Makhachek, your. Uh, Position uh, or just a uh, uh, few remarks. Uh, uh, I think uh, it would be if, if I understand it well, what Mr. York said that these days, class, if there are some classical liberals left in the U.S., they are hidden or more in the Republican Party or probably voting Republican Party. That would be uh, more. Um, uh, they will be quite optimistic scenarios uh, because if they have these uh, beliefs, these principles, these ideals, they they don't have to call necessarily themselves classical liberals just for the case of some order in uh, uh, terms, but uh, they just have some representatives who represent their ideals, but it's getting, it's not that easy because some of the uh, or most of the Republicans are really conservatives, conservatives, and especially now with these um, uh, issues uh, related to abortion and even contraception, etc. I know that it's a very sensitive and particular and unique topic for the uh, for the U.S. So uh, they might have troubles to decide if to, to vote for Republicans or. Maybe they, because th these issues are really troubling for some people, they might even prefer to uh, uh, call, uh, vote for some uh, progressive. But this is about the voting, so it's not about the like political discussion or about the political philosophy. And uh, speaking about Europe, just based on my experience, uh, uh, for instance, when we started to, to think about this and organize this discussion, we had very welcoming like remarks from everyone from our partner is very uh, limited what is the definition of liberalism so it's you discuss like uh, everything you like uh, they discuss like refugees they discuss 
they discuss cheese, they discuss they discuss uh, open borders, they discuss uh, climate change, but uh, there are uh, there, there is that makes me a little bit pessimistic that there is no third and hunger for these discussions which I myself consider absolutely crucial. These discussions, sorry, are not happening in Europe, the discussion we have here now. I, I don't know about any. Uh, if you know, let me know. But uh, that's my impression as being a win witness of few congresses of all the party myself. Roman, you, you actively took uh, the mic, so I think you have some, but sh sh shortly, because I would like to give uh, some time for a question. Uh, I, I would say that in the past, uh, American classical liberals were more represented in the Republican Party rather than in the Democratic Party. Uh, th that was the, let us say, Barry Goldwater, Ronald Reagan consensus. 60s till the end of the 20th century. However, now I would say that uh, Republican Party is becoming a mess, uh, but the main reason is not, let us say, authoritarian or coercive attitudes in cultural moral issues like abortion or, or others, but it's a cult of personality of the former president, Donald Trump. And those supporters of Donald Trump who claim that, well, he was never mistaken, he was brilliant, he was great, he was not defeated in 2020, which was, of course, uh, he was defeated, of course. He knew that, but he lied to his supporters all the time. He's lying till this day about that. But those uh, who support him claim that they are something like national conservatives. And they try to import to America something like a European Tory or Urbanist tradition of using government for their own, they call them conservative purposes. But in fact, it's a copying of the, of the tactics of the American left. American left or the left wing of the Democratic Party claims that because of the terrible past of America, of racism, capitalism, and, and so on, we must provide something for our ethnic minorities, especially <coughs> African Americans, but Hispanic Americans as well. And these Trumpist Republicans now would like to use the federal government for white middle class Americans. <coughs> so it's something like Tory paternalism. There. Okay, thank you. And I saw the, there was a one question, but uh, sh shorter question, please, and just introduce yourself. Good, good afternoon, Kamalovin speaking. I have a question for Mr. Joch. You've been advocating for freedom of speech, so I would like to ask you uh, what do you freely think and how would you describe uh, current uh, administration in the White House, which is uh, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden. I use this uh, first Kamala Harris because she is she's well. Joe Biden is, uh, as we can see many times, he's not well. He's having some troubles, you know. We don't know what are his troubles, but sometimes he cannot even see whom to shake the hand, you know, which is very sad as a leader of the free world. So I would like to know what is the, how would you describe political agenda of a Democratic Party? But also, if you can describe Republican Party uh, under Ron DeSantis, probably next president. Thank you very much. And you have two or maximum three minutes <laughs> to describe everything. Well, American President Joe Biden is an old man. And for his age, he's doing well. I don't think I will be doing as well as he's doing now. And I don't expect I will live till his age. But the age is, is visible in him. 
um, and he is not fit for the office. Healthily, for f from health reasons, not political reasons. Again, I admire that he is doing so well in his age. I myself don't expect to live till that age. Now everybody sees that. That's visible. That's simply visible. And uh, there are going to be elections, midterm elections next week, in a week, Tuesday next week. Um, there is no surprise that the ruling party, the party of the president, will lose seats. Uh, they will lose the House. The Senate is more open as a question. But I am sure that from the Democratic Party, immediately after the elections, there will be demands and voices that President Biden should promise that he will not run again. That Democrats will have, um, will have a new candidate for president in 2024. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris is even less popular than President Biden. So for Democrats, the best option would be a young or relatively young, middle-aged, successful governor of a re reliably democratic state uh, who, is a, who is popular. So had I been uh, a democratic strategist or donor, those are important, I would advise Democrats to, to, to choose a new candidate for president, and they could win. You, you have mentioned that Ron DeSantis could be a Republican candidate for president. Yes, he could be. He could even win. He is quite popular in his state, in, in other states. But I see as a great spoiler of Republican chances Donald Trump and his ego. If Donald Trump runs again, he will get the nomination. Because grassroots of the Republican Party are mad, they are deeply in love, hysterical love, with Donald Trump, and they would nominate him again if he runs. And if he runs, he will lose. The Democratic candidate, whoever he or she is, would beat again Donald Trump. Uh, and so, so I myself would recommend Republicans to nominate Ron DeSantis. He's the most electable. A Republican politician who could party is in a suicide. He will win the nomination and lose the election. So there is nothing to do with that. The, the, it's One has another reason to admire all those Platonic and Aristotelian arguments against democracy. But that's, that's the situation we are stuck in. So we will see what will happen, but definitely now t our time is over, so I would like to say thank you, gentlemen, uh, Roman Joch, Jan Macháček, and online uh, Gianmarco Bovenzi, so grazie and arrivederci, and thank you. thank you, thank you for your attention. Now we will break for the lunch, and we will continue at 1 p.m., so thank you very much. Thank you very much.